we are at liftoff and welcome to the episode 188 of the crisis jam learning community my name is john draper i'm the president of research and development at behavioral health link and i'm delighted to be with you today as we feature Brad Pendergraf, the Chief Clinical Officer of Protocol Services, and he's going to share with us today some practical tips for using artificial intelligence to expand the capabilities of our real intelligence in our everyday lives. So feel free to visit Crisis Jam's learning community site to get all the latest information buzzing around the crisis services community, as, as well as just register for the newsletter at talkcrisisnow.com. And I, I hate to miss a crisis jam, but I know where to go if I do, and it's right there on the jam site where I can see last week's fascinating broadcast on crisis intervention teamwork, which was live from the CIT conference in Indianapolis, and you can find other news, updates, and resources from the world of crisis services that you might have missed, and you can find it all at talk.crisisnow.com. Well, you got to join us for the 988 day this Sunday. I don't know what you're doing on Sunday, but I'm going to be putting on my Crisis Jam 988 shirt. I'm going to be parading it around town, and at 8 o'clock on 98 Sunday, I'm going to be raising my glass in celebration of 988. Please, we got a lot of work to get the news out. Let's do it on 988 Day. We also have World Suicide Prevention Day coming in September, but you got to know the entire month is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. So this is an entire month in which we can get out the good news of suicide prevention. Let's all do so, leveraging social media, print media broadcast, and online media to let people know that there are ways that we're preventing suicide and tell them what you're doing and what we're all doing to make a difference. Oh, there's also National Recovery Month. This is a big month. So it's not, we're not only just talking about preventing suicide, we're also talking about how to get beyond the moment of mental illness, beyond mental health, and into quality living and reasons for living and embrace them fully through National Recovery Month. So please celebrate and get the word out about recovery as well. You know, there was a recent article, you ought to check it out in Newsweek, about people using chat GPT for therapy. Uh, and they this is not with a chat bot. They're just going right into the chat GPT, putting in their thoughts and feelings and ask, ask chat, asking chat GPT, what do you think? And it'll tell them about what they think you're feeling. And then if you ask them what your recommendations are, then you'll get recommendations back. Are they evidence-based? I don't know, but it's interesting. Check it out. Tell us what you think. Now it's time to drag you all into the hot seat to stew on this week's trivia question. Now, if you look at that that line right there, that's uh, that's a Google trend line for searches. Uh, so this trend line here goes way up, and it suddenly goes up for searches on specifically AI. And this being our topic for today, I'm curious what you all think, as we're all in the hot seat today. So which November did Google Trends first show a significant spike in searches for AI? So there's A, 2020, B, 2021, 2022, or D, 2023. What do you all think? The countdown is on. No hints. If you want your t-shirt, Let's see. Let's see what the audience is voting here. Okay. I got my vote in. Let's see what y'all think. Mmm. Okay. Y'all finished? We got it? Okay, a lot of people are thinking 2022, but no, it's actually 2021 that looks like the most, right? No, no, it's, no now it's it's even, 2022, 2021, and here's, here's what the real answer is. 2022, 
really interesting that X, formerly Twitter, needed two years to amass its first one million. It just took five days to reach that for ChatGPT. It launched just a few months after 988. It is rapidly becoming a part of everyone's life. And if you think that's terrifying, mm, wait till you see our next guest. So we're gonna bring out to you our next guest, but first you wanna lock up the kids or just hide them, certainly lock your doors because here comes the Chief Clinical Officer of Protocol Services, Brad Pendergraft. Brad, we're so glad to have you here today to tell us about some practical uses of AI. Take it, take it away. Thanks, John. Hey, everybody. As John mentioned, uh, today I'm talking about practical uses of AI, and we have about 15 minutes, so I'm going to be very focused. Uh, uh, but I still think it's worth, from the beginning, talking about why I think this is so important and why should crisis center directors, why should anybody associated with the crisis center field be practically engaging with AI right now? And I think there are two main reasons. And the first is about what's coming. Uh, to some extent, it's already here, but I believe that within uh, a year or so, uh, if not months, it's going to be possible for us to have a AI structure supporting our counselors in such a way that they focus purely and only on, on the callers or on the visitors and chat and text. What would that look like? Uh, it, there would be a, a, a live transcript of the conversation going that they can see as they go with what's called sentiment analysis, analyzing the emotions, popping up, maybe turning red for risk situations, having uh, coaching feedback from an AI happening inside that uh, that stream based on on your uh, your training, your knowledge base, or or the the 98 standards, making suggestions. Hey, Brad, you need to build a little more rapport there, or this would be a good time for the first question about suicide. As this is happening, or at the end of the call, uh, there would be an AI documentation getting created for the counselor to review and 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 approve that that's what happened, but they're not having to document during the call. They're not doing it afterwards either. At the end of the call or at any time that you would want, the counselor could receive a full uh, AI-based uh, QA for that call with real-time, uh, with immediate uh, feedback on what they would need to do differently. They could have the opportunity, if there was time after the call, to immediately engage in a live role play with an AI, practicing exactly what they needed to improve based on that. Some of these things are already being used in customer call centers, uh, and they will all be, in my belief, they will be uh, feasible, uh, cost-effective, and straightforward to implement in a very short time period. And that means that we in crisis centers need to think about, well, do we want that? Which parts of that do we want? What's actually going to support our counselors best to do the jobs? And so I think that that's the first argument for why we should all be getting our, our hands and our, and our uh, keyboards into uh, a generative AI, a foundational model like ChatGPT um, right now. The second reason uh, is that it can actually improve things for you in your crisis center right now. Uh, I'm a, a counselor, not a technologist, uh, but I use uh, one or more of the models every single day uh, to do things from preparing from this for this talk, to uh, preparing for performance evaluations, to thinking through uh, organizational changes, to doing things uh, uh, inside the organization. So today, uh, in, in this short time period, I'm only going to have the opportunity to, to demonstrate two very uh, quick uh, examples of how you can use this immediately. And what I've been able to do uh, is to uh, set these up in such a way that you can uh, practically begin to implement versions of these right away. And I'll be putting stuff in the chat later. I'm I'm cheating by not talking through all. I'll add you extra tools and things in the chat later. Uh, but what I want to demonstrate a couple things uh, today. First, it's my recommendation you engage with one of the main uh, foundational models, uh, uh, ChatGPT, Claude by Anthropic, uh, or uh, Gemini by Google. Uh, and uh, ChatGPT is what I'll be demonstrating what I use primarily because in all of these, you can build out, they all have different names for them, but you can build out basically 
what you can think of as an assistant, which is a specific use case for the AI that is specially prompted and is using a knowledge base, like your training knowledge base, to actually uh, guide the AI uh, in addition to its its main training. And so uh, the what, what I'm going to show you uh, is an app that we built, but the proof of concept was built in ChatGPT, and you can do that. Uh, currently, uh, free versions allow for the usage of these assistants. So what might this look like in a, in a training um, situation? Let me share my screen here. So again, uh, ChatGPT, this is what it looks like here. Um, GPTs are, are what uh, they call the, the uh, what I call the assistants. And I'm gonna provide you with a video about how to build them. Uh, but so you can think of that while I show you this more sophisticated version, but it's only because it actually, uh, in ChatGPT, you need a mobile device to do the voice to voice that I'm gonna demonstrate. And we built out a version, a way to do that for our counselors so they don't need ChatGPT uh, subscriptions. All right, so this is a role play. Um, ready? We use actors uh, to do role play uh, in our training process, but you can't scale um, having uh, a actor at any time. And let's say um, I'm struggling with risk mitigation. So my supervisor sends me over here and here's what I do. Hey, yeah, my supervisor tells me that I'm struggling with risk mitigation, especially with lethal means. Uh, apparently, I, I move too quickly to emergency services and, and don't uh, utilize uh, the least intrusive uh, uh, interventions. Can you take me through a role play? Let's start in the middle of a call where there's some lethal means and, and then, you know, give me feedback as I practice mitigating it. Can we do that? There'll be a little latency here. It's getting better, though. Uh, and it's actually faster inside ChatGPT itself. Absolutely, let's work on this together. Before we begin, I have a couple of questions to tailor our session. One, feedback timing. Would you prefer real-time feedback during the role play where I offer guidance and corrections as we go or post role play feedback where I provide insights and suggestions after we've completed the scenario? Two scenario details. Could you provide a bit more context for the scenario you want to practice? For instance, is it related to a specific type of lethal means, e.g. firearms, medication, etc.? Any particular client demographics you want me to role play as, e.g. age, gender, background? Once I have this information, we'll start the role play. Okay, so rather than actually engaging in the role play for time purposes, I'll just promise you that it becomes extremely realistic and you can adjust all these options as as uh, as was illustrated there and uh, you can do those directly inside chat gpt so what might this look like if you were going to build out something like this for your counselors inside um, chat gpt it's actually very uh, very straightforward um, but uh, um, noticing my time here uh, let me mention also the uh, second usage, and then we'll, uh, John, maybe you can give me a time check as we go, and then uh, I'll, I'll be able to decide uh, how much to dive into. So so that's a, a, a training usage. Uh, so what's it actually illustrating? Well, it's illustrating scalability. As I mentioned, you can't, uh, you, you can't scale an immediate response to someone uh, who's struggling with something, right? You can't have an actor come in, you can't immediately pull them off and pull two counselors off to do a role play. Uh, but with something like this, we can um, uh, ha have people practice exactly the specific things that they're, uh, that they're struggling with. Another example of scaling uh, is through quality assurance. Uh, it's already possible uh, to have uh, QA feedback from AI for your counselors uh, protocol, our organization, and uh, LISTEN are currently in a randomized clinical trial supported by NIMH, testing the effects of getting counselors feedback immediately when they need it 
uh, on calls on their suicide assessment. So these are some of the things that you can that you can do right now. Well, what else can you do right now that maybe not is specifically for your counselors? Well, I use these uh, these tools every day, as I, as I said, and I, I really encourage you to uh, build out these assistants. Uh, custom GPTs is what uh, Chat GPT calls them. And so let me illustrate a different use case, uh, perhaps a, a, a little smaller, but but extremely useful. Uh, let me share my screen again this time. So over here, I have 20 or so different um, ones that I have built, and they're very straightforward to build. The one I use the most is what I call an external processor, uh, because I think uh, out loud, and it's been incredible incredibly useful to be able to have a thought partner who I'll just talk through and then I get uh, my ideas fed back to me in a summary form, kind of similar to, to what uh, John mentioned that some people are, are using ChatGPT for in terms of uh, personal awareness. But in this case, I'm just going to show you what it looks like on the inside. And again, the promise is I'll send you a video of how to build this yourself. Uh, but uh, here there is a uh, an extensive prompt. Uh, about how, what what I want it to do, and there's good good research on how important it is to get these prompts um, really uh, effective. And so, one of the things that I'm going to be promising you today is this is a little meta here, but I, I built a um, I built a custom GPT to help have you build the prompts to build your own custom GPTs. Uh, we call it the Proto Prompter. Give it away at all all my trainings. And I'll give you the link, a link to this that will allow you to build out really sophisticated prompts for uh, for any purpose that you might want. The uh, last thing I'll mention here, and John just cut me off when you need to, but I think that one of the the questions that come up really commonly is, uh, especially around like training uh, purposes, is well, do you need to use client data to build these tools out? Uh, and the answer is no. You can build a um, incredibly sophisticated simulated role play without ever using real client data. And it and the way you would do that actually illustrates a lot about how AI and ChatGPT works because the human brain is affected by what we've already thought, uh, and it's hard for us to improve ourselves. But every every window of of, uh, of ChatGPT is a new opportunity to examine something. So if you wanted to build out a, a training guide with model uh, calls. You would never need to use real calls. All you need is, is to start with one role play that you have, uh, feed it to chat GPT, get a transcript, have a transcript of it. Uh, you would, I, I'd suggest you and your team get together and analyze it, say, well, you know, this person should have done this a little bit differently here. Here's what I would have uh, expected them to do better. Take those things, Give it to ChatGPT with a prompt that I'll show you how to build, uh, and it will generate a um, example for you. Then you take the same thing. It won't be perfect yet, but then you analyze it again, feed it back to itself again, and very shortly you'll have a model calls that then you can use that then ChatGPT will use to uh, evaluate your people. So what have we done today? Right, very quickly, um, trying to uh, making the argument for the power of practical uh, applications right, right away. Get into ChatGPT, uh, get a paid subscription because it allows you to do some things that to build these things, but your counselors only need free subscriptions. Uh, then begin to, uh, you know, I'll put this in the, in the chat, but let's build a community. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll, I'll, I'm happy to help people and connect other people who are doing this. I've already helped the crisis line uh, in British Columbia. Uh, one of their counselors is building out a phone trainer for them. Uh, so uh, take action immediately. Uh, look for things to read. I'll put them in the, in the chat. Uh, and the best recommendation I've heard is 10 hours worth of playing with this uh, starts to get you a feel for what you can do. And then you become like me and you've got the vegan chef assistant who tells you what to to build out a menu every week for you. So uh, move through that pretty quickly, but we'll have a chance for the panel to comment on it. And I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. Thank you. Love it, Brad. 
really excellent presentation. You've got some buzzing comments in the chat, some people uh, noting raves about how this affects the, the sharing and development of policies and trainings and helping to enhance quality, and also some concerns that Rachel noted specifically from an article um, that kind of reminds us about how some of the data that is the chat GPT may be mining could be biased and could really affect the way in which uh, it advises or recommends specific behaviors, um, which is a reminder to us that you're saying with the assistant, we can train our own GPTs, and you're going to be including uh, the instructions on how to do that. You gave us some hints on that. I'm not sure everybody heard it or memorized it. They could certainly watch this again and again. Some will, but please do provide us with those instructions. We've got uh, some folks who are itching to talk about this on our round table. We're going to first start with Dennis Morrison, the CEO and consultant, Morrison Consulting. Dennis, you with us? Dennis, are you hopefully in the house? Or maybe when I said lock the door, you locked yourself out. Um, we also have Zach Amell, Dr. Zach Amell, who's the chief science officer from Listen. Zach, please chime in and tell us what your thoughts are after listening to Brad. Um, hey, everyone. Brad, fantastic to see what you're you're up to uh, these days with, with ChatGPT. I I think it's not surprising, maybe, I, given the work I do related to artificial intelligence, I think this stuff is extremely exciting. And the amount of flexibility and power that someone who's as creative as Brad is and can sort of pull in these types of tools in order to solve really key problems that, that crisis centers have is really exciting. I think, I think the questions I have are related to some of the, the, the chats that are the chats that were posted here where as powerful as this is there are lots of concerns about sort of taking even a, an adapted model that you're training yourself with prompts and other sorts of inputs that we really still don't understand the types of variance in the content that we're going to get unless we start to test it at scale where I, th I think the the example from the the article that I think it was Rachel Levy posted is a good one where this is obviously that was a clinical use case where they're using this therapy and that's not what Brad's recommending here but it's a it's an example of unexpected behavior occurring and then I will as a very self serving I will point people back to a crisis jam that I presented on how these chat GPTs are trained from July where I talk to ChatGPT about how I was feeling stressed out. Can you help me? And it offered to give me a cocktail recipe. And so it, there, it can do things that are surprising. And I think what we don't know yet is in the context of using this for training tools, what are those surprising things and how do we study them? Because they could be subtle. And how do we, how do we start to build tools that we can rely on, but still have the flexibility and the power that is, is so very clear? And I, I hope we end up marrying those two objectives. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate that. And let's see if we can bring in our next roundtable guest. Or is, is Dennis with us again? I'm hopefully Dennis is with you. Dennis, you snuck in the door. It's good to I see did. you. I did. Well, please tell us I what mean, your thoughts were. Hopefully, you were able to hear Brad's presentation. Were you? I was not. I apologize. The the, Just uh, make stuff my, up then. Feel free. I've been having, having many problems with uh, logins lately, but mm. uh, I know Zach, and I know that uh, he probably did a great job with with uh, his comments. So I will just tell you that you know I, I think one of the things that I'm most impressed with with these kind of technologies is, uh, and and the fact that we one of the things we tend to forget is that um you know we we refer to this as artificial intelligence, but it's really augmented intelligence. And that the goal of all these technologies is to help clinicians do a better job, do their jobs better, faster, easier. The American Medical Association has has advised that um, that when we think about artificial intelligence in healthcare, that we should be using the term augmented intelligence more accurately because it's not uh, these are not replacements for clinical judgment; they are augmentations to clinical judgment. So uh, you know the things I would um, 
advise people to do is to think about this as kind of the future of how healthcare is going to be delivered. Um, you know, we have a problem right now in all of healthcare, actually in all of uh, uh, life, but particularly in healthcare, that all knowledge has a half-life and that the half-life for psychology in general is about seven years. And that means that there, it, it, it's the amount of time that it takes for half of everything you know about a subject to become obsolete. So we, there is no way that our current, um, the current way in which we provide ongoing education to keep clinicians current by CEUs and going to conferences, that is woefully inadequate to help any clinician stay on top of their job. It's worse in medical care. The half-life of their knowledge is about 73 days. So what, you know, when we think about trying to stay on top of that, that fund of knowledge with all the research that's being generated, um, we can't do it anymore. And this is where augmented intelligence is actually going to take us. And it is kind of the future in terms of how care will be delivered going forward. So every, every uh, healthcare application, particularly in behavioral healthcare, um, all of them are augmented intelligence applications. They, they are not uh, artificial intelligence applications that are kind of making decisions on their own, like a self-driving car is, a, is an artificial intelligence application. The car does not, a self-driving car does not ask for permission to make a left turn. But augmented intelligence tools that are out there, you know, like Elios, Listen, Limbic, uh, Bell's AI, all of them are giving clinicians information to help clinicians do their jobs better, easier, faster. And that's the start of where we are today. But going forward, we will see that kind of enhanced by, by virtue of, of these AI systems that can help us, help give us information that will help us stay ahead of that half-life curve going forward. And I, but the, the bottom line is this is the way healthcare will be delivered in the future. It's going to be a kind of a symbiotic relationship with computing and technology. And, and these technologies that are extant for uh, where we are today, like the one, you know, that, that where Zach works with, with, these are, these are kind of, these are really the first applications that I have seen in my career of where, of technology that has been geared to help clinicians do their jobs better. You know, we talked about that with electronic health records. It was, it was way oversold. We said EHRs will make your life better and faster. It didn't. It made it harder and more, more difficult. But this technology, these technologies are, are really there to help clinicians do their jobs better. And it's one of the first, the first things I've seen in this, in, in our, in my career that really focuses on that. So let me stop there. That's fascinating, Dennis. I, I love this half-life notion. I hadn't heard those th these data before about that, but uh, it, it's a reminder that when we're the ones training our assistant, we're teaching it limited knowledge, which only has a certain amount of, of half-life, so to speak. So in some ways, ChatGPT can teach us more than we can sometimes teach ChatGPT. Chat that is, if we don't just take it lock, stock, and barrel, if it tells us about articles that we can read up on uh, and that we can then integrate into our new knowledge base. But fascinating. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, let, me, let me just add something. I, I, you may have covered this before I got on, and I apologize for logging in late, but but you know, ChatGPT is is a general purpose AI model that uses a large language model, eighty four percent of which was scraped from the internet. It is it is replete with bias and all these other things, and and every general purpose AI is like that. And it is not it is not to be used for healthcare purposes. It does not have any protections for PHI. The the large language models that listen and all of the other applications out there are purpose built for the work that we do. And so, you know, ChatGPT has its place. I was just working on an article uh, just recently, and I went to ChatGPT to get some ideas and thoughts, but I, but I always checked everything in it because, um, you know, they, they, these things can, these are not hundred percent accurate. Uh, and, and I just, I want to get into one of my pet peeves here. We talk about AI systems that hallucinate that they, AI systems don't hallucinate. They confabulate. Um, mm. They, they they are making stuff up when they don't know the answer. So right. from as as behavioral healthcare professionals, we ought to be using the right term. Society has kind of chosen the term hallucination, and it's it's way misleading. That it's really just you know kind of like what you see in dementia patients sometimes, where they just make stuff up because they don't really know the answer. It's the same thing that happens in in these large language models. So uh, with that, I'll stop again. <laughs>
Really appreciate it, Danny. Great points. And I want to see if Arrow Foster is with us. Uh, Arrow, are you here? Yes. And I love being the last one to speak because that makes it easy for me to say, I agree. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to hold some of my comments because I have a piece coming up that's going to talk a lot about what has just been discussed. I do want to say, I think the training capabilities of ChatGPT are profound, especially for our profession, because we use it on the trainings that we do around the world, and we use it to refine the trainings. We use it to help us find out if we're hitting all the knowledge, skills, and abilities. We're not creating the training, but we're saying, hey, we need an overview. We need another perspective, a new eye, like we used to say, right? To help us hone in on those things. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that bias when I speak a little bit later too, because that is truly something we need to be watching for. Thanks, Aero. Really appreciate that. But as much as all of that was stimulating, and I'd love to talk about it all day, we'll come back to technology in a little bit. But first, I think it's time to hear from a man some call King Richard or Big Mac or the first mate of 988. Dr. Richard McKeon is going to give us a SAMHSA update. Richard? Thank you so much, John. Glad to be with you. Fascinating discussion about AI chat GBT. Um, certainly, we are listening with interest to understand the technology, um, how it can be used, how it shouldn't be used. So really glad for the opportunity to do that deeper dive. So a couple of things. We are just four days away from the first annual 988 day. And so we are really uh, hoping um, and anticipating uh, that uh, that 988 day will lead to a increase in awareness that is significant for Americans that 988 exists, that it's effective, and that it's available to them. Obviously, 988 can only help if you know it exists. Um, you know, some of the data, it's a little bit old now, you know, showed that only a minority of Americans were aware of 988. We're working hard to try to change that. Um, and there is a whole um, a group of materials on the SAMHSA website um, for telling people how they can uh, in, participate and engage in 988 Day on September 8th. And of course, two days later is uh, September 10th, which is World Suicide Prevention Day. And the United States is pleased to work along uh, with um, other nations in promoting suicide prevention across the country. And for those who may not be aware of it, later this year in November in Minneapolis, uh, the International Association of Suicide Prevention will be holding a conference on suicide prevention in the uh, Americas. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we'll be on a, um, a panel that will be focusing on hotlines and 988. And just in case for like old timers like me hearing about all of this technology, is making you a little nostalgic for the past. Um, I, I'm gonna show you a couple of things. Hard copy, they do still exist, but these are from the vaults, but they're really important milestones in our efforts to, improve, to use hotlines to improve suicide prevention. Can folks see this? Can you see it, John? I can, and I, I'm, I'm taking that to the beach. That looks fascinating. Can you read well, it out loud? What does it say? It, sa it says, a silent monitoring study of telephone help provided over the Hope Line network and its <laughs> short-term effects by, with, by Brian Mishara. This was That's the, the very, Smithsonian, isn't it? This was the very first SAMHSA grant, and they were actually... Uh, evaluate is listening into the calls. And John um, took the results of this study and used it to move forward um, advances on the on what then became the lifeline in 2005. And it led to things like this. 
You may recognize this too, John. Oh, this, yeah. The suicide risk assessment standards packet. And this remains a core component for 988. Um, so important as well. And then my final from the vault is the this is the imminent risk policy uh, that was developed um, and with additional evaluation support from Dr. Madeline Gould from Columbia. And I'm mentioning all of this to show the past history, but also to emphasize the importance as we move forward um, in continuing to deepen our knowledge about how to help suicidal callers, chatters, and texters, and to improve uh, the already existing science base uh, to help us make these, at times, life and death decisions on the lines. But we have a solid foundation to work on, um, and I thought it was appropriate to focus on that as we're in Suicide Prevention Month. So that's what I have. Thank you, John. Thank you for the historical tour through the Samson Museum of Lifeline and 988, and I'm not sure everyone could could see it the way you're holding up to the camera. So if you have a link where people could grab those, download them, and just as I was gonna do, take them to the beach, uh, then put that in the chat if you can, Richard. But always great to see you, always great to hear from you. And now it's time to hear from our dear friend, Nashbit Megan Howe. Aw, thanks so much, John. It is great to be on. Um, you know, as we talk about chat GBT, uh, and what works, what doesn't work, and training, we really want to uh, talk about e the E-Mental Health International Collaborative, uh, E-M-H-I-C, um, and I'll put more information in the uh, chat box on this, but the E-M-H, or E-Mental Health International Collaborative really involves about 19 nations coming together uh, having cross-border collaborations uh, among government officials, people with lived experience, innovators, researchers, uh, clinicians, and those committed to the effective implementation of digital mental health within their jurisdictions. Um, the E-Mental Health uh, Congress is going to be taking place September 19th and September 20th in Ottawa, Canada. This is a very exciting effort, especially after talking about what we've been talking about here. And so this year's Congress is entitled Digital Building Capacity 24-7 Mental Health Support for All. And it's all about how to build capacity in mental health by enhancing accessibility, affordability, and effectiveness of mental health services. So, uh, you know, how to really do this well and uh, brag and steal so that it's, uh, you know, that we know we're on the right track in really uh, doing what's tested and effective. So thank you so much. Back to you, John. Thanks so much, Megan. I am really looking forward to both the Digital Behavioral Health Conference as well as, as the IASP Conference, the International Conference for Suicide Prevention in, in Minneapolis that Richard was talking about, both really going to be tremendous events. But now it's time to hear from our friend Sarah Corcoran, who's going to give us some state and federal legislation updates. Thank you so much. If we can switch to the next slide, uh, the House and Senate will be coming back to D.C. next week after their August recess. So I thought this might be a good time just to kind of look very quickly at the FY25 federal appropriations and kind of where we are at, at this point in the process. Uh, just a quick note, the uh, column on the left is the Senate numbers that are have been proposed. The column on the right is the House numbers. So we'll see a little bit of a difference between how um, each chamber has approached the FY25 process. And one more quick note before we go into the specific numbers, neither of these sets of numbers are final. They still have a bit of a uh, ways to go before they can find agreement, pass the same bill in both chambers, and uh, send it to the president to sign into law. But as of now, um, both uh, chambers look relatively close on how they are uh, proposing to fund SAMHSA for FY25. 
with a 1.4% increase on the Senate side and 1.3% increase on the House side. Um, the major difference that I think you'll note here is the uh, proposed funding for the mental health programs within SAMHSA. Uh, the Senate on this left-hand side here proposes a 3.3% 3 .3 increase over what last year's um, numbers were, whereas the House side proposes a 5% decrease um, and looks like they are putting most of that money, they propose to put most of that money more into the substance use side of the um, of the bill. Uh, for the mental health block grant, the Senate proposes a $35 million increase over last year's funding, which is $1.042 billion. And on the House side, it is $1.022 billion for the mental health block grant, which represents a $15 million increase. Um, both bills continue that 5% crisis care set aside within the mental health block grant section. Um, for 988 specifically, of course, interest to everyone on this call, the Senate proposes a $20 million increase to the line item. So that would be $540 million. Um, and on the House side, they would propose level funding uh, at this year's rate, which was $520 million. For CCBHCs, Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics, uh, that grant program on the Senate side, they propose increasing that line item by $15 million from last year up to $400 million, whereas on the House side, uh, they would keep it at the same level as this year uh, at $385 million. It's a lot of numbers, so that's why they're all written down for you. Um, for the zero suicide level, I'm sorry, zero suicide initiative, uh, the Senate actually would propose a new uh, older adult suicide prevention pilot program at $2 million. And the House side does not include that, but it does include um, a uh, $1 million increase. Uh, for the national strategy, a $2 million increase proposed on the Senate side, $1 million on the House side. And then the major difference I think I'd, I'd want to highlight here, especially in these mental health programs, the Senate would uh, keep the mental health awareness training program level with FY24 and would propose a $10 million increase for that mental health crisis response grant program. Um, notably, in the House version of the bill, both of those programs, they propose to zero them out and discontinue the programs for FY25. So I don't mean to scare anybody. None of this is written in stone yet. They've got some time and they need to figure out uh, if they can find agreement. But since the new fiscal year will be starting in about less than a month, we are looking for a continuing, looking forward to a continuing resolution to keep us funded through election season. And then we'll get some more clarity that we, we hope to share with you by then of uh, what the end of year will look like in terms of FY25 spending. I think there might be some questions in the chat I will handle there. If anybody else has any questions, please fill them in and I will do my best to answer. That's it. Thanks so much, Sarah. The, I really much prefer what I'm seeing on the Senate side. I'm hoping, uh, hoping they can be ultimately the most persuasive of the bodies and we can see that uh, all the increases across the board that is being promised there. Really interesting stuff, and thank you again for all the reports on that. And please do take care of some of the questions in the chat. You know, tech has really cornered the agenda today in the crisis jam, but we're going to go right back to that tech corner. And sitting there is our friend Zach Amell, who we haven't heard from for a while. It's been about 15 minutes, Zach, but look forward to hearing more from you as always. Thank you, John. Yeah, I was getting antsy. I'm glad to to get back. <laughs> um, so, um, if we could just jump right in. So um, I'll start with the actual concept rather than the technology. So um, how could we think about the use of technology and AI to understand empathy? And so there's there's a lot of great research that goes back decades on this. Um, one of my favorite papers from a good colleague, Terry Moyers, and of course, Bill Miller, that it's one of the things that we really understand about this area is that low therapist empathy is not a great thing. And here's the thing, next slide. We we know how to measure it. Um, so this is thing psychology nerds like us have been working on for a long time. There's a lots of established scales that can help us measure empathy directly, but it's, it's a challenge. Move to the next slide. Because what we end up having to do is identify specific types 
of empathic communication. And so this is just one example of what that might look like. A lot of us in the counseling world will recognize this as types of reflections where the provider is offering back their understanding as a way to communicate that they care and understand about what's happening. Um, next slide. But what we see in the real world is dramatic variability. This is a paper I did with one of my mentors at the University of Washington, John Baer, over 10 years ago. Um, looking at this is around 200 providers 800 sessions that were coded by humans for empathy and what you see when you look in in just general practice is massive variability you've got folks with expressing this deep deep understanding of a client's worldview amazing work and we've got folks on the other end who sometimes i've listened to a lot of these sessions maybe they're burnt out maybe they're struggling they're just barely listening to their clients. And so what are we supposed to do with that? How do we measure that sort of stuff at scale and give feedback to people? Next next slide. So click all the way through this. This there's we've been talking about this stuff today. There have been massive innovations in this area. And this some of these innovations aren't particularly new. The public's awareness of them is new, but we have been working with deep learning models for more than a decade. And the use of natural language processing, speech recognition, the ability to extract data from spoken language has changed in, in ways that are just hard to understand in the past 10 years. Um, and so next, next slide. So what are the types of things that get fed into a model like this, right? So it's the words, it's, so it's what you say, it's the tone, it's how you say it, it's not just that if you have video, it's the posture you're conveying as you're listening. It's the interaction between the client and the speaker. It's all of these things put together. And then next slide, we learned how to extract these things where we can take patterns from words and turn them into data. We can do the same thing by extracting acoustic features. We can quantify digitally posture and the way you're moving and the same with the level of entrainment. And we can turn that all into data that can train these models now. So next slide. So what we have been able to do, and this is some of the work we've done at the University of Utah and then at Listen over the years, we took around 200 sessions that were coded by humans and then used that data to train a machine that could correlate human ratings with machine ratings and show really strong correlations. This next image here are both machine ratings of sessions that were intentionally made to look like really bad motivational interviewing, where someone was really judgmental and kind of picky, and then someone was oh, really empathic, and you show that the machine and the human ratings line up really well. Um, next slide. We've done that in a bunch of different outcomes. This is the final slide I'll talk about here. So this is a paper we just published with Talkspace. This is around 5,000 providers, 176,000 clients, 22 million text conversations, where we looked at empathy for all of these providers in these conversations. Each dot here is a provider, right? And so we've got this huge range of empathy, where we've got some folks who are doing really quite well and some folks who are struggling. And the, the issue is that it, it really matters. And so there's a couple more animations here. For folks with really low empathy, people just don't stay in treatment. They don't feel like you hear them. You don't, they don't feel heard. And for folks who do have high empathy, they stay in care longer. They get the treatment they need. The problem is it's just not possible to get this level of insight and feedback without using new technological tools that we're building. And the piece of data I, I guess I would add to that is it's really critical that we understand the performance of these new tools. So we do validation work to understand how accurately are there, what types of things can we understand, what types of things can't we, and where, where are the potential biases hidden. So excited about this intersection of AI and empathy and all this stuff we've been working on for a while and excited already. It's kind of coming along for the ride these days. It's fun. Oh, I love that, Zach. And, you know, Richard had earlier said something about the silent monitoring study back in days of yore with Brian Mashara. A uh, couple of things that this your your presentation reminded me of. He said, you know, good contact and empathy is the most important thing that can happen in crisis care. But he had to listen to a whole lot of calls, and some of the things he heard was not so great. And I I would absolutely agree with your friend Bill Miller, who who said that it can be toxic to have low empathy. Um, but one of the things that that especially in a crisis situation where you must be understood and you feel perhaps thinking about suicide if somebody doesn't understand you, doesn't seem to care about you, 
that's a very risky scenario. But I was going to ask you something that Brian Mashara said is he doesn't believe we can treat, we, we can actually teach empathy. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts? I, I, I do believe there's individual differences in the capacity for empathy, but having trained hundreds and hundreds of uh, beginning therapists, I very much we can teach, believe that we can teach the skills to communicate it. Mm, yeah. So I think there are, are people who come in who want to be empathic, want to be able to communicate that and just don't have the language for it. Mm -hmm. And I think we can provide that to them. Uh, now, are there are there folks that um, maybe will struggle ever to get that language? Maybe I'm, I I tend to be a little more hopeful than that. And I'd, I we don't have enough folks and I'd rather train them. Um, yeah. if I can. That's a good point. But through your measures for empathy, maybe there's a way to also recruit people and identify people who are empathic and get them in the right seats at the right time as well. Um, I want to also turn now to our not not just our Pierre Corner, we're going to bring Arrow Foster into the center of the room and Pierre Central. Can you give us a little peer-to-peer -peer insight, Arrow? Yes. And once again, it's like this, this whole thing has been set up for what I have put together today. So if this sounds repetitive, please bear with me. And for those who are doing the slides, I'm not going to go through them one by one. So you can just like every 30 seconds, switch the slides as I go through this. But I'm going to talk about peer support services and AI, the intersection, in the context of crisis intervention. Um, AI is increasingly being integrated into these services, as we've heard today, and it offers significant enhancements. But it also presents challenges, especially in the realm of peer support, which is so deeply rooted in human connection. So I'm going to start with the benefits. It's revolutionizing how we assess and respond to crises. Tools like the natural language processing LLP allow us to analyze color's language and quickly determine the severity of the crisis. And this can be really helpful for peer supporters who often handle high stakes situations. If you can imagine an AI system that flags language indicative of suicidal ideation in real time, this enables the peer supporters to prioritize and focus their attention on the most critical cases, ensuring that those in immediate danger receive the prompt and appropriate support. AI can provide personalized recommendations also, which I think is the biggest value, offering peer supporters insights into the resources that might best meet the person's needs. This tailored approach <clears throat> can really enhance this experience and make it more effective and more meaningful for the individuals that we serve. Um, and, and, and another one that I really like is the, is the simulations and decision support systems, it can really play a crucial role in training peer supporters. And by presenting these realistic scenarios, these tools can help prepare staff for the complexities of real life interventions, not just the theories and the models and what the perfect world looks like, but what does this real life look like? Ensuring they're equipped to handle all of these situations and handle them with confidence. Now, however, as with any technology, there are challenges. One of the most significant that has been brought up here today several times that I believe is really important is the risk of bias and discrimination. Um, the AI systems are only as good as the data they are trained on. And if that data is biased, then it can perpetrate those biases, leading to unequal uh, treatment uh, results. For example, an AI system might not recognize nuances in language, colloquial verbiage, and things like that from different cultural backgrounds, potentially misinterpreting the needs or the severity of the situation. And this can have serious implications for the fairness and effectiveness of the support. And another concern is the dehumanization of care. Peer support is fundamentally about human connection, empathy, and understanding. If we true, if, if, if we rely too heavily on AI, we risk losing the very essence of what makes peer support so powerful. AI yeah, might streamline the process, but it cannot replace the warmth and compassion that a peer supporter brings to a conversation. It's crucial that we find that balance, using AI in to enhance and not to overshadow the human touch that is core to our services. And privacy has been brought up here, and it is a critical issue. AI systems require access to sensitive personal information, and this really does raise concerns. So we must ensure that robust measures are in place to protect the privacy of those we serve. And that helps maintain that trust that's essential 
to these relationships. So um, while it offers, AI offers a lot of incredible opportunities to enhance peer support services by providing the tools and the insights, it's got to be integrated thoughtfully with an awareness of the potential risks. And that's what I think is so important about these discussions we're having here, these crisis jams, we're really fleshing a lot of this out and that is so important before we move forward. Let's advocate for AI systems that complement rather than replace the human element. And the power of peer support lies in our ability to connect deeply at a personal level. So let's ensure that that remains at the heart of what we do. Then I'm going to turn it back over to you, John. Amen, Arrow. I love it and agree 100%. And now we got to hear a little crisis talk from our friend Stephanie Hepburn and Denny Morrison again. Stephanie. Thanks, Dr. Draper. Um, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Morrison. Uh, he has served as the Chief Clinical Officer for NetSmart Technologies and the CEO of Centerstone Research Inter Institute. Uh, Dr. Morrison, you explained earlier why you prefer the term augmented intelligence instead of artificial intelligence. When we chatted, you gave the example of Elios, uh, you're on the board of directors, as a tool clinicians can use. Can you share how this helps clinicians but doesn't supplant decision making? Yeah, and 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 we talk about this in the context of behavioral health care, but it's been it's happening throughout all of healthcare, and um, like in, in in a lot of forms of technology, behavioral health care has lagged a little bit behind general health care in terms of its implementation of new technologies. It was true for EHRs. It's also happened. It's also true for uh, artificial or augmented intelligence. <clears throat> um, the the when you think about uh, this use of augmented intelligence, the, the whole point of this is to help clinicians do their jobs better, easier, faster, and give them information that they may, that can help them do that job. Take, for example, radiology, for example, there are, there are purpose-built large language model AI systems that will analyze uh, x-rays, for example, and look for certain um, pathologies in the x-ray. Those, mm -hmm. those systems do not make a diagnosis of that pathology of that cancer um, blurb on the x-ray, they, they usually give like a probability statement to the radiologist and say there's an 86% chance that this is a carcinoma, which calls his attention, her attention to that, to that spot and says, you know, like, let's them make a decision about whether or not that's accurate. So in, in that same sense, what we're seeing now and the stuff that Zach was talking about, you know, Talk is is the treatment for behavioral health care. We, we, you know, we talk to people and doing analysis of images like in an X-ray is a heck of a lot easier, not easy, but it's easier than analyzing the nuances of language like Zach was just showing in terms of identifying empathy and stuff. We, we weren't able to do that before we had tools like natural language processing, which does, in fact, analyze uh, the vocalizations that we have in therapy. And so... When, now that we're able to do that, we can now provide information to clinicians in a way that's kind of like having a co-therapist in the room with you to point out things. Did you notice this? Here's a clinical insight. This is a summary of what the clinician said. Or even the, in the case of people who are mobile workers who are out in the field to help them kind of get, kind of quickly capture information they have to document. So what we're seeing in a lot of cases is these tools are giving clinicians information, regardless of whether they are desk-bound clinicians or if they're mobile workers out in the field, to help them do their jobs better based on their clinical workflows. But they're not making decisions for them, nor are they are they kind of taking away their responsibility for that. And, and that's crucial because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are signing off on, say, a progress note. They're saying that I, John Smith, said that I'm documenting this is what happened in this clinical session. It's not the AI system doing that. The AI system is giving them suggestions and ideas. And did you notice it? What I've seen with, uh, and I'm sure Zach has seen this, where clinicians, you get when you provide information like this, clinicians oftentimes, the, the AI system will say, did you notice? And the clinicians say, I didn't even hear that. Like, I know one case where a system said the patient uh, client mentioned grief three times during the session. And the clinician said, I missed it. I didn't hear it at all. And any of us who have done clinical work, you know, you can't capture 100% in your brain. You, and you have biases because you're listening for certain things if their diagnosis is X 
you may not be listening for grief or something like that. So the kind of a, the selective screening. So that's where these things add value to the clinicians and help them make their do their jobs better. Thank you so much, Dennis. What you have really provided for us is, is a consistent message that we've heard throughout today is that AI and these technologies can augment complement the work we're doing, not replace it, not be the same as it's not going to be, but it can help us be better at the work we're doing and certainly scale the work we're doing as well. Um, we've got a few things to look forward to in the following weeks. We've got the Burn Jag and Skip working with state administering agencies that's kind of going to be coming uh, from Elizabeth Pyle and Dr. Matthew Lynn coming in uh, just a week and a, a week after that. We can also hear from Angela Roberts, who's going to be speaking about the Kentucky 988 marketing for LGBTQ plus and African-Americans. In the meantime, I want to thank you all for joining us today and we'll see you next week when we spread a little jam on your toast. <laughs>